Hey everyone, Jason Schaffer here, M0A.com, and in this video, we're gonna fly a short field takeoff and a short field landing. What is happening, M0A Nation? Jason Schaffer here, so thankful you are here. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like and subscribe on YouTube, on Facebook, it means the absolute world to us. And don't stop with just this video. Don't forget about our entire online ground school, private instrument, commercial, fundamentals of instructing. Take a trial at M0A Trial. Dot com. Hey, it is uh, the year of 23 Mike Zulu. It's 2023. So it's the year of 23 Mike Zulu. We've been giving away something each and every month. Last month you saw was mock check ride May. We gave away that one hour mock check ride with myself, which was so amazing. Uh, this time we have an amazing giveaway from our friends at my go flight, giving away a great package of some of the gear that I use myself as well. Head over to m 0 a contest.com to enter to win that package. And then on June 29th at 8 p.m. Eastern time, I'm doing the secret to perfect landings live. I'll give away that great package from my GoFlight and then you'll get some great content as well. So m0acontest.com and also save June 29th on your calendar. So we just did a short field takeoff and landing video a month ago, it seems like. And I loved reading your comments and that's really why I wanted to revisit this topic because the most popular thread on that video said, well, Jason, is a short field landing really even a smart decision? And I said, wow, that, that's a great question. Many of you said, thanks for teaching me about short field landings. I know I need to do them on my check ride, but short field landings just exceed, or even short field takeoffs certainly exceed my personal minimums. I thought, We've got some good pilots in the Missouri Nation, so I really appreciate that. But I wanna challenge you a little bit further because we so often think of a short field as, oh, it's less than 3,000 feet. Oh, it's a 2,500 foot strip. That's a short field. Anything less than 3,000 feet, it's beyond my personal minimums. And that could be right for you. And so many factors depend on your aircraft and everything else. But let me ask you a question. What if an obstacle made it a short field. Let me draw an example here for you. What if you were trying to go to an airport um, that was 5,000 feet long? Now, those of you who know me know that art, mm, it's really not my thing. Let's say though you're looking on whatever EFB app you're using and you go, I'm going to this airport, it's 5,000 feet long. That's, that's, of course, that's within my personal minimums but you're a smart pilot because you're watching this video, so you dig a little bit deeper and you realize that there are 50 foot trees. First person to give a happy trees comment wins, I guess. What was what's that guy with the hair, the happy trees guy? I can't think of it. But anyways, what if there is a tree um, here, right at the approach end? Well, yes, you have a 5,000 foot runway, but if I have to clear this obstacle and my soonest touchdown point is here, I may have 5,000 feet of pavement available, but I only have 3,000 feet of what's called effective runway length for landing. Does that make sense? So you've got to really dig deep, and this is why we practice a short field landing, clearing an obstacle to hitting a very precise point. You may not always be able to get to the threshold here unless you're in a helicopter or something. You may have to deal with effective runway length. I know you all have seen this video before. Um, it's a clip from St. Bart's. By the way, in St. Bart's, the runway's 2,119 feet long, very much a short field. Um, but as you see in the clip, it has a large hill and a road and probably some power lines and everything else on one side. The pilot clears that obstacle, arguably a little fast, also a lot of airplane. We know what happens when we take a short field in that case and make it even shorter. And managing things like we'll talk about when we get to the airplane here, managing airspeed. But you see a big problem I see people make is they simulate a short field on longer fields there's not a real consequence. And I don't want there to be a real consequence per se, but it's very different when you're simulating an obstacle and simulating, pretend this is a 3,000 foot runway. 
It's very different when I was able to take learners to an airport that was 3,000 feet long and 50 feet wide. It really changes. And there's plenty of safe airports out there that fit some of that criteria. And think about the takeoff aspect of that as well. Um, is it a VX climb out? Are there flaps, no flaps? All of these things go into factor on the takeoff. And something else you're gonna hear me say in this video once we get into the airplane here, you'll hear me say on the landing, I aim ahead of my point. And many of you had questions a month ago on this, and I apologize for not clarifying it greater. You've gotta aim ahead of your point. If I am, if my goal is to touch down back here, I know my aircraft, especially a 172, carries a little bit of float. No matter how well you manage your airspeed, you're gonna float just a little bit. So my aiming point, my eyes might be looking more like over here, knowing I'm gonna to touch down here. For your private pilot, your commercial pilot check rides, it's the same thing. You wanna aim, depends on the airplane, about 100 feet actually before your point. And, and if this is, this is something we're gonna be talking about too on that June 29th live stream, The Secret to Perfect Landings, June 29th, 8 p.m. I really want to see you there. Now, before we get to the video, I want to teach one more thing that I promise to be a game changer, and it's unfortunately back to the drawing board. But we know in private pilot, we're told to touch down 200 feet. We have a 200 foot window. It's actually, you know, minus zero. I can't touch down anything before my point for the ACS, and private pilots 200 feet beyond that point. If we draw our runway, and let's just draw centerline stripes here. Did you know a centerline stripe is 120 feet long and the gap between it is 80 feet? So think about it this way. If I am aiming for the beginning of the first centerline stripe, I have 120 plus 80 is 200 feet, private pilots. So I know I have from the beginning of the first centerline stripe to the beginning of the next centerline stripe, that is my 200 foot box to, to aim for, for a check ride. Commercial pilots, you're limited to 100 feet. Well, it's tough to go, a centerline stripe is 120 feet, the gap is 80 feet. I make my commercial pilots land in the gap. But, so from the beginning, uh, the start is the end of a centerline stripe to the beginning of the next. It's a higher tolerance because it's only 80 feet and you technically have 20 feet of margin, but we're commercial pilots, we're aspiring to a higher level there. So just something else, something new to really look at uh, and to know to really, really help you uh, on those short field landings. Let's cut to this video. And by the way, this is, we're going throwback on this video, but it's such a good video. I wanted to really showcase this here because the team works so hard in the production of this throwback video, you'll see two, three Mike Zulu, it looks the same from the outside, but you'll see that before the avionics upgrade. So a bit of a throwback, slightly younger Jason here, but still a great quality video. Watch that and we're gonna come right back here to the studio. Just finished my run up, taxing over to hold short for two, three at the Williston Airport, um, and going to show you a short field takeoff, followed by a short field land. And a nice little lap in the traffic pattern here. I'm sharing the pattern with one other that just departed. I'm watching it for a bit here. I don't see anybody on final. I'm gonna angle out that way still and look. Everything looks great. And when doing a short field takeoff, it's important to consult our POH, where our flap's supposed to be, all these little line items here. I'm gonna go ahead and make a radio call, let them know we're departing. And Williston traffic, 23 Mike Zulu's departing runway, 23 for closed traffic at Williston. All right, coming across that whole short line. I like to use and I teach using every bit of runway. So we're gonna come all the way over here, simulate this is a real short field. We're at a place like Cedar Key or somewhere that's real short. I'm gonna use every bit of runway here. Crosswind for runway number two, three, Williston. He's on crosswind. Come out after using every bit of runway. Confirm two three two three two three. I see it outside, both inside. Smoothly applying full power here. Holding the brakes. Engine gauges confirm green, green, and evenly off those brakes. Rolling here. We're going to rotate about five knots sooner, and we're going to climb out at VX. Here we. 
we go, rotating sooner. There's our speed. Up, up, up. Looking good, climbing out VX. Clear of our obstacle, let's say, as we pass through 50 feet and lowering that nose to a nice VY climb. And at this point, if you had flaps, according to your POH, flaps probably about 10 degrees, you'd be babying those flaps up and out. Continuing to depart out, I had a very aggressive climb here. I want to now that back to VY, make sure I maintain center line out, maybe even taking a peek back, making sure everything is good there as I continue to fly out. And then we're gonna come around and I'm gonna put it right down on the numbers two, three, and I'm gonna talk you through that process as well. Now this is gonna be interesting here too because in a perfect world, I'd wanna start my landing here you know, be my touchdown point, car beat power back, 10 degrees of flaps, but I've got traffic out here base. I've got the traffic. Now I've got to extend out and adjust my pattern a little bit to this traffic here. Straight out, runway heading. I got one departing, I got one on base, and then by the way, Mr. and Ms. Check Red Examiner, you expect me to hit my point. See, things aren't always perfect, or as they seem, are they? I'm going to start a very, very slow descent. Car beat on, just bringing back another 100, 200 RPMs. Because I really don't like to actually start my, my turn and my descent in until he's a beam me on final. So I always say a perfect landing starts with a perfect traffic pattern. A perfect pattern is not always an option now, is it here? He just departed. I've got him out here on base. He's been three, five, turn four, final. Four, Zulu, turning final for two, three, Williston. I'm a beam him now. I'm going power Zulu, back. Full stop, Williston. I'm going 10 degrees of flaps here. And I'm just managing my, I'm 90 right now, right where I want to be. I don't want to ride his butt, though, and get too close. So now I'm turning my base. Wilson traffic, 2-3, Mike Zulu's left base, 2-3, full stop, Wilson. Oh, someone stepped on me. And 2-3, Mike Zulu's left base, 2-3, Wilson. I knew someone stepped on me because I heard him in the last second, which means no one heard anything. That's why I made that radio call again here. This is good. This, was, this wasn't the intention of this lesson, to make it a radio communication slash dealing with other traffic in the pattern lesson. Now, wait till you see what I'm seeing here in just a second. I am way out on final. And you're thinking, uh, somehow I have, to, I have to still hit this point when I'm flying this big old you know, bomber-style traffic pattern. But this could happen on a check ride. You don't always get the perfect traffic pattern with no one in there. You don't always, ATC, or if you're on a tower field, doesn't always vector you for the perfect little approach here. I haven't added any more flaps. I'm going to save that for... Uh, as soon as I turn final here. He's over airport proper now. I've, I've slowed down to about about 85. And Wilson traffic 2-3 Mike Zulu's turning and extended final. Long final for 2-3 Wilson traffic. Let him know. I don't want to scare him and say, hey, I'm turning final when he's over the airport fence. Let him know I'm an extended final. I'm a long final. Scene. I'm, I'm out here. And I don't want him to feel pressured to rush either here. I'm even kind of trying to round this turn on through, if you can see, to buy him some time, but still my focus is, by the way, I want to hit those numbers two, three. You have to, in aviation, be willing to adapt, be willing to adjust. You know, I was presented this situation. It might behoove you to fly a bigger pattern and still try to hit your point here. Airspeed's king. I want to be about 80 right now, and I'm going to need another 10 degrees of flaps to pull that off. Three, five, four, four, zero, clear, I'm in number two, three. He's Next clear. Back to two, three, well, He's clear, runway's mine. I'm looking, I'm slowing to 75. Everything's looking good. I'm putting, in this seat, I put the center line on my chest. In the, if you're sitting in the left seat, you're putting that center line on your right shoulder. Left seat, center line, right shoulder is going to help you a lot. Speed's really, really great. I'm holding 75 right here. I have 20 degrees of flaps, and I'm holding 75, right? That's, that's pretty, pretty good here. I'm going to get some more flaps in a little bit closer here. I like to make a lot of adjustments. I'm at full flaps now. Baby and on back, coming in over airport property at 70. Coming on in and know your numbers for your airplane, know your POH. I am aiming ahead of my touchdown point. I'm aiming about 100 feet in front of the numbers two, three. Basically, I'm aiming for the end of the runway here. I'm coming in, everything's looking good, looking good. Hold it off, don't touch down before your point. Hold it off, hold it off, hold it off. Two, three, and put her down. Just like that. And short field, aerodynamic braking, right? Back on the yoke, apply the brakes. They don't like you fiddling around a whole lot here, but if you have the time and the, and the thought, you bring the flaps up as well. Now in retractable gear aircraft, they don't like you touching any switches down there, but in this, it's okay to reach down, grab those flaps. A, a bit of a throwback, but a cool throwback. Let's talk it through here real quick. 
Take off considerations. You heard me say, I use all available runway. Runway behind me does no good, right? What about your correct flap settings? It's different for every aircraft. You need to do and follow, the POH says use flaps, don't use flaps, hold the brakes, maximum RPM setting, then release. That's a typical procedure there, but do what's right for your aircraft. Because I have seen some that just say, hey, give me a, a smooth acceleration without brakes. I've seen that happen before, right? Typically, you saw in this video, I'm applying back pressure, I'm rotating, I get to VX, and I apply that elevator pressure to hold that airspeed until I'm clear of this fictitious 50-foot obstacle, then it's to VY. But when do you retract the gear? When do you bring up the flaps? These are questions to ask your POH, your Pilot's Operating Handbook. Then on landing, what we talk about? Well, you heard me say airspeed is king. We'll be talking about that on the June 29th uh, webinar a lot. But you have to realize you've got to use pitch to maintain airspeed and power to maintain altitude. I pitch for airspeed, I power for altitude to hold my glide path. Well, you understand that concept. I'm telling you, it'll be a game changer for your flying, your slow flight, for everything. But we've got to be stabilized. We're looking for no to minimal floating, even though he said most of these aircraft float. I want to also explain, because I'm sure you had a question, I was talking so much in that video, about my right shoulder being on the center line for someone sitting in the left seat. You need to see what center line. For me in the left seat, if I'm sitting left seat, I put that center line on my right shoulder. That's gonna work for most people, depending on how broad shouldered or narrow shouldered you may be. It may have to adjust for you as well. But you also saw I was focused about 100 feet ahead of that point as well. And the last thing, well, we apply that back elevator. If you're able to get those flaps out, now caveat here, some flight schools, some DPEs are not crazy about you touching anything on the ground. Many flight schools I've seen nowadays teach simulated aerodynamic braking. That's because there's been some NTSB reports in retractable gear aircraft where someone is rolling out, they think they're bringing up the flaps and they're bringing up the gear. And a squat switch should prevent that, but it doesn't always work and they gear up the plane on the rollout, as ridiculous as that sound, but you can find the NTSB reports that show it. So some place, some schools just say, pretend you're bringing up the flaps. Just tell me you know how to do that. Um, but in the real life scenario, I bring up those flaps because that gets weight back on the main wheels. It's called aerodynamic braking, and your brakes are more effective when you get more weight on them as well. So listen, I know this is a longer video, but I hope you really enjoyed it. I hope you didn't mind my art as well. I hope that was okay. Again, to win that My Go Flight uh, package uh, that's uh, there on your screen for you, m0acontest.com. That winner will be announced on June 29th. I'm doing a classic presentation we've done in the past called The Secret to Perfect Landings. I'll be live at 8 p.m. Eastern. You won't want to miss that. Have a blessed, abundant, outstanding rest of your day. And most importantly, remember, the good pilot is always learning. Have a great day, everybody. See ya.